friends. My name is Jess and you're listening to Club, Seed Club's podcast. Today I'm very excited to bring you a conversation with Jack Spallone. Jack is at High Five Labs, which is a novel artist incubator it's bringing incredible acts and technology into the Web3 music space. He also previously led the team at Ujo Music and was early into Consensus. So Jack is definitely what I would call an OG in the music and Web3 space. It has a ton of experience working on the edges with fun drops like tape with RAC. He gets into all of this in his introduction a lot more. But what I found fascinating about this conversation and why I wanted to bring him on is that Jack looks at the emerging space in music and Web3 at a level that I think very few people do. We get into the weeds. We talk about music copyright and how that relates to Web3. We talk about new models and how these net new revenue opportunities are emerging. And I think more importantly, how those two things might come together. He also shares with us a couple ideas for the future that I think if you're a builder in the space or if you're keeping an eye on what might be coming, you'll very much want to have a listen to. Really enjoyed this winding, deep conversation with Jack Spallone. So let's get into it. Jack, welcome. Why don't you give our listeners a, a brief introduction of yourself? Yeah, thanks, Jess, and thanks for having me on. I started my career in music, managing artists, back in around 2012, 2013. This was after kind of a, I wouldn't call it the start of my career, but a loose passion and working live events, booking talent at shows, etc. And then in 2013, I started helping two guys that I lived with basically promote their artists online. And this is back at a time when that was really flourishing for electronic musicians. We were able to get artists on Hype Machine, uh, which was a former like chart site for musicians where they ranked songs that were coming out primarily via SoundCloud um, and tracking blogs. And then I was kind of turned off by a lot of the ways that music licensing worked and how royalties were paid. And this was at a time when streaming was taking off and streaming payments were very kind of ubiquitously understood as very low. I tell people that uh, this is when like Taylor Swift and Adele didn't have their catalogs on Spotify. So it was very common knowledge that music royalty payments were incredibly low. And I thought that was a good area to focus my career because I was also interested in this idea of Bitcoin as a apparatus for social good. And in a very theoretical sense, it applies itself very well to music royalties. And then when Ethereum came out, the Ethereum white paper anyway came out, it was all of that theory in a very crystallized form. Smart contracts, royalty payments kind of go hand in hand. That's the thinking there. So living in New York in 2016, I was working with an engineer building out open source metadata schemas for describing intellectual property for the purpose of bringing compatible music copyright systems into smart contracts on Ethereum. This led me to Consensus, where I helped lead the product development of Ujo Music, and I deployed the first user-generated content platform built on Ethereum. And we had a way of describing music rights on both the publishing and recording side. And it was very early stages, incredibly early in the now what is well known as Web3, but this was at a time when MetaMask was still this very clunky UX for people that they were unfamiliar with. There was no such thing as like stable coins on Ethereum. So volatility of the price that we were transacting in was a big kind of obstacle for people. But over the years, we really explored and researched a tremendous amount of ideas across the music supply chain before I ended up leaving Consensus in 2020. And around that time, I released Tape, a project with RAC where we sold 100 tokens that were redeemable for a physical cassette tape of RAC's album, Boy. They were sold on a bonding curve, and in October of last year, they were selling for as much as $13,000. So it was the most expensive cassette tape ever sold. And the real kind of celebration there was this idea of bringing price discovery and units back to music in this era of the streaming buffet, where it's $10 all you can eat per month. And yeah, ever since then, I've been riding this wave of consumer adoption of Web3 and musicians pouring into the space. And I'm now working at a company called Hi-Fi Labs, where I'm exploring how the artists themselves, in my case, musicians, can be the leaders of defining the technology, uh, which is, I think, a unique opportunity that we have at this moment in time. Yeah, we're exploring some very fun things at Hi-Fi Labs and 
really we're trying to be the most advantageous and beneficial artist deal an artist can get. We think that technology has a lot to do with that and if it can help artists keep their copyright and we could depart from those older advanced models then uh, we'll be in a very very positive future. So yeah, lots to get into there and, and we'd love to touch in on Hi-Fi and what you're up to right now. But take us back because I think the the streaming royalties or the low streaming royalties is, is I think like the, the thing most people realize is sort of or see as being what's wrong with the music industry. But there's a, a bunch of other business models that are sort of ingrained in and around the music business that I think are also maybe not problematic, but challenging, or at least maybe this new wave of Web3 is, is challenging those business models. And I'm specifically thinking about the way that managers earn their money, thinking about how labels earn their money, and then also thinking about this sort of third-party curator slash tastemaker and, and like the importance of those folks in the development of acts and yet the, the challenge for them to actually participate in the value creation around music. Can you maybe just get into some of the challenges that you're seeing within the music business as it stood and largely still stands today? Yeah, so it's helpful to break down the music industry in, in a supply chain sense. And it's not very linear per se, but it's helpful to think like, okay, we have our supply side and we have our demand side. And the music industry as we know it is really predominantly the recording music business when we talk about royalties. But there's the live performance industry, and that, that really is its own thing. There's this publishing industry, which is hand in hand with the recording industry. But then you have artist teams like management. And then you have the demand side, which is fan experiences. It's everything from Spotify to Hype Machine, as I mentioned. It's fan clubs. It's everything along those lines. And all along the way, artists need collaborators. They need companies. They need people, etc. And over the past 20 years, as the music industry, which is like this very old calcified industry of media it predates movies it predates film has three pillars to it it's the artist it's the actual creator it's the businesses around that artist and then it's copyright law and copyright law because of the infinite fungibility of music has been historically for over the past 100 years but a necessary apparatus for protecting artists and I say that because like, if you and I wrote a song right now and we performed it in front of a crowd and then someone was like, wow, I really love that song. And just by ear, they were able to recreate it. There should be some protections to us for them performing or recording that song somewhere else. So these, those three pillars have kind of grown organically together. And that's what I get to with this very calcified industry. But in the past 20 years, this traditional legacy industry has been folded over into this digital world. And the way music licensing has worked has largely been an extension of how it worked historically with all of these various parties in place, as well as copyright law, enforcing protections. And it has not so much leaned into any innovation because of the legal parameters, regulatory parameters around what you can do with copyright due to the existing copyright law. So the DMCA, Digital Millennium Copyright Act of the early 2000s, was largely a response to music being pirated online. It now shapes how we look at user-generated content platforms. It looks at how we look at most all copyright being shared on the internet. We also had the Music Modernization Act, which came in 2018, so far after the DMCA, but only then were they acknowledging a new way for collecting royalties online. So... I say all this because if you break it down into these various parts, there's many, many areas where companies need to fit in and help process the other distribution of the music or the actual collection of those royalties. And it's incredibly complicated. Without the historical knowledge of how it worked prior to digital, if you looked purely at the music supply chain and all the various parties involved, you would say, this makes no sense. I mean, from the one hand, we have technology that can enforce usage and licensing programmatically without any intermediaries now, yet we still rely on policy as a backbone for enforcing things through courts, which is sort of at odds, one, with the culture of music and the proliferation of music through culture, but it also is just at odds technically with what's possible. So I'm interesting to unpack that a little bit more, but I'm curious kind of 
where amongst this entire forest of music you're most interested in unpacking? Yeah, I think there's two things. So why I was so interested in talking with you is because you are looking at music through a lens that I think most projects that are engaging in Web3 music today aren't looking at it through. And I think that's through sort of existing legal structures, copyright law, et cetera. In fact, when I talk to most of the teams that we're working with that are building, they've essentially set that aside, right? They said, whether that's, we're gonna deal with that in the future, or it's, we're hoping to do entirely new agreements, or we're only gonna work with indie artists, et cetera. There's this, I, I think, belief or, yeah, a belief of, okay, well, let's, there's a lot of things to, to figure out. If we can figure out the business model, or if we can figure out how to build momentum in our product, that's going to be the good first step. And we'll think about the supply chain or like the, the copyright law later. I think you come at it from what I'm going to use as like an old school, I'll call it old school only because you've been around and, and this is sort of 2017, 2018. And God, that's when I joined the space and somebody called me OG the other day. So it's old school. Jack, it's old school. But so I guess maybe that that's maybe the first place. Like, why is this so important to focus on this existing incumbent structure? Why not just set that aside and say, well, we're just going to go build over here in our own new world. Come hang out when you're ready. Sure. So it, it's actually both, right? It's this technology presents a new, more efficient option for doing things in the way they've been done for collecting royalties for, say, music streams. At the same time, and this is more about the past, I would say, year of NFTs and consumer adoption of crypto or Web3, this also presents net new experiences and opportunities for monetization that have just never before existed. And they do truly sit outside of those regimes. They can be very conflated at times, but yes, we have this legacy kind of old school, first wave blockchain music cohort of thinking that really puts this emphasis on music licensing and music rights information and where there are solutions for that. For example, the smart contracts dividing royalty payments, very intuitively understood, makes a lot of sense, but requires, it's like the innovator's dilemma issue. It requires the entire industry to adopt it. And there's too much risk, too much capital requirements, too much coordination that the appetite for making that transition is not going to happen until the absolute necessity for it doing so. On the other hand, we have NFTs kind of showing a way where you can do things that sit outside of copyright, that connect artists with fans, that have the same values of what we're talking about, but there are no legacy or incumbent obstacles for innovating in that space. So I think one is on its own timeline, advancing music rights and licensing with elements introduced through cryptography and decentralized networks is probably on like a 10 to 20 year timeline of being fully realized. Whereas we are already in the active moment of seeing how other elements that are anchored on a blockchain using crypto that embody this Web3 ethos are already changing the lives of artists today. And they are distinctly different things, but on a very long enough timeline, it is all all encompassing and they're they're not mutually exclusive. Yeah, I like that framing. I think that the projects that I'm most excited about are ones that are taking action, being pragmatic in the short term, but are also keeping their eyes on the big functional shifts that need to happen to I think really unlock a lot of the value that, that most of us see in Web3. And we had a, a great conversation recently around music NFTs. There's a lot of energy around music NFTs right now. For a while, it sort of seemed as if they were being left behind. And I think there's a few new platforms and tools and uh, experiments that are that are coming out that I think are getting people excited about the possibility. Um, but you sort of see there's, there's some limitations in the current way that we are thinking about music NFTs. I wonder if you can maybe first highlight why NFTs are such a big deal for artists, especially the ones you're working with? And what are we missing or, or, or where do we need to go further with them? Yeah. So, I mean, this is such a hot topic. I'm going to first start by using this framing put forth by Matthew Chaim of Song Camp that I think really eloquently just puts each NFT in its own category. And we have one of ones, which he calls canon. And an example of that would be catalog, the music outlet releasing NFTs, and they lean into the same language. They use Canon. And then you have additions or collectibles or, you know, one of many that represent one thing. And those are akin to what sound.xyz is doing right now, where 
they're doing listening experiences by owning these tokens. They're selling like 25 NFTs that point to one song. And then there's this idea of copies. And that's like the infinite accessibility of the music akin to like streaming, but also just like, hey, I get to play the song and I play it, but there's no token representing that. It's just infinitely reproducible. So you have Canon collectibles copy. And that, if we were to take that framing for how music NFTs and streaming fit into different mediums or consumption models, we can actually take that and very directly apply it to copyright law. What I would propose, and this is a part of many discussions I have had with so many people, so it's, it's more of me summarizing, I think, many, many different people's ideas, is the canon is this idea of it's a token. The one of one NFT is not copyright. It's not the song. You are not selling the song. You're not selling rights to the song. If anything, it is a license to listen to it for personal use in perpetuity, akin to like a digital download. And I think that's fine, but it's you're not selling any rights. You're not selling any rights to earn royalties in the future, because as soon as you get into that, you not only start bringing in copyright law questions, but you also bring in securities laws questions. It gets complicating, and we should just absolutely avoid that, because I think there's enough of a demand for this idea of this NFT representing the song, and it being the first version of that song ever being released. If you bring in that dimension of time, if an artist chooses to release a one-of-one -one canonical NFT, say, at the moment they release a song, that thing should be valuable just on its own. The artist is the author that, using their personal wallet, minted this thing on chain. I think that has value, and I believe that that will be increasingly recognized as something of value, irrespective of it not being the song or the copyright itself. I think that's okay. And then you take what sound is doing, and you look at them selling 25 NFTs, they're very explicitly not selling any copyright or rights to royalties or things like that that infringe either on copyright or securities laws. Yet, there's a demand for it. People like the idea of being one of the 25 collectors. And then there's the copies thing. And let's just keep that separate for now because there's not a great example of NFTs representing that. But I think that's where everything else fits in in a long enough timeline. So if we were to take one of ones, if we were to take this idea that every artist, when they release their music, they first release a one of one. What that could also solve for is this idea of nailing down rights information. So here's a little antidote. Some music, if not the majority of music, goes out to distribution to DSPs like Spotify or Apple Music with a whole bunch of rights information, aka who to pay, how much they get paid, what percentage, how to pay them, etc. Every piece of music is actually two forms of copyright. It's a recording and it's a composition. Each one of those necessitate different payments for each. The recording is like the physical thing. It's like this is the song, the product. The composition is the underlying song, the invisible idea or the actual notes of the song. So you and I could create a recording of any song that exists, but if we were to get the actual recording of a song, that would require its own license in addition to a license to the composition. So without getting too much into that, music often goes out as a recording, as a file to distribution, and the rights information on, say, the composition isn't even figured out yet. And this makes payment events happen with these DSPs where they're reporting on usage, they're saying this recording has been streamed X amount of times, who do we pay, and there's no composition information. There's no publishing information yet because... A few people collaborated on the song, they each have their own publishers, they're still deliberating what the percentage shares are, etc. And it creates this very clunky process around who to pay and how to pay them. So if we take one of one NFTs as, hey, high, high, high valuable item, this is the first thing you do when you release a song. In fact, now we're just contextualizing the release chain so that it has a dimension of time. Rather than like, we're releasing a song, it's on DSPs, all you can eat, press play as much as you want, $10 a month. You say, first, we're going to release this one of one NFT. We're conceiving this song, and there will be a lifetime to this song. And in doing so, you need to put in all the information relevant to that song. Who are all the collaborators? Who is everyone that gets paid from this? What are their wallet addresses for this? So when you put all that information into, say, like Catalog's user interface, Catalog can then take that information and they could put that in a decentralized storage network as an addressable object. And you can imagine the media file could be associated with that, but the media file is actually less important here than getting that rights information correct. Because if I own an NFT 
for a song, I care less about the media file than I do of it just actually being a representation of that artist or artists and the title of that work than I do about my access to that file. Like if I want the file, if I want to listen to the song, I can find it. I can get it somewhere. That's not the problem. So my point here is you use this one of one idea as an on-ramp for a song into its lifetime in a digital ecosystem. And by emphasizing the importance of that, you require that they nail down all this information in a way that then becomes this memorialized canon of this piece of work. That solves for this rights issue, but then sound can then say, we're going to use this standard way of doing things where we're going to release a 25 copies of this song or collectibles of this song and rather than require that x artists come to our user interface and upload their work and give us all the information and whatnot we could just plug in to this decentralized network that has all this information already and then with that artist wallet that minted that one of one they can press deploy the 25 collectibles based on the same exact information So we've just reduced redundancy in the supply chain. We've increased efficiency in time for the artist. And we also simultaneously create this rights registry of information, which for music doesn't currently exist at scale. There's no single source of verifiable information around works. And then you can imagine that, let's say another sound exists or another collectibles application exists. Let's say an app wants to create a hundred versions of a song and any of the purchasers can redeem a token for a physical item of the song like a vinyl well they can do that too and they could just programmatically plug into this system or this protocol or the standard way of doing things and then they could allow the artist to come in and say yes i want to do this and then sign with their wallet and mint these things so you start to see the kind of forest for the trees here with web3 and how all of these systems actually plug in and are the same thing and we do that centrally with this wallet representing identity, and there's other characteristics there, but that being brute force authenticator, if you will, signifying that this does come from this artist. But then you have this entire system or supply chain where you can deploy these releases on top of it. And none of this represents the copyright. And I can get into that a little bit more now if it'd be helpful, because where does copyright exist in this? Where do royalties exist in this sense? If I go to catalog right now and I play a song, but I don't own it, is there a royalty that's owed? I can speak to that a little bit, but I think that's where the question remains. Yeah, so really fascinating. I hadn't seen the connection between some of the earlier work being done in the space and what is being done with projects like Catalog as far as being sort of like a a way of capturing that initial all-important data of rights, et cetera, participants, owners in that media. So that's super fascinating. Yeah, I would love to get into copyright a little bit because I think it is something that, as I said before, we're sort of stepping around. But maybe just to frame that, Jacob Horn from Zora wrote a piece earlier this year called cryptomedia.wtf that essentially is asserting this idea that NFTs represent ownership over a digital file and that there's now this business model or value creation mechanism where one person can own a thing, but the value of the thing gets or increases the more people that listen to it. And so he, he sort of says, uh, and I'm just quoting from the cryptomedia.wtf site, crypto media means we no longer need to trade off universal accessibility and usage for value capture on the internet. It means that the more that the object is shared and used, the more valuable it becomes. It inverts how we think about creating and capturing value on the internet and provides the foundation for a sovereign internet owned by everyone. That seems to fly in the face of this idea of copyright. And I think, again, why I'm so fascinated to talk to you about this is I think there almost seems to be this sort of wanting to set aside legal structures that, you know, obviously we're very guilty of with the crypto space more broadly and and maybe rightfully so, but this still exists. And so I'm curious through that that lens of maybe crypto media and, and what you just shared with us, how you see copyright fitting into this world. Yeah. So I'm one of Jacob Horn's like biggest fans. I collaborated on the release of Zorro with RAC and I really, really love this idea of that, you know, the the value from something comes from its accessibility and ubiquity, not so much gating it. And whereas I agree with it, it's just incompatible with copyright law as it is with respect to music. So I'll say for digital visual art, there has never been an industry. There have never been copyright protections for sharing images online in the way that music has. So if you create a piece of digital visual art, and then I find it on Behance 10 years ago, and then I share it on Twitter, no one's going to come after me. 
And then let's say like thousands of people share this thing, like LOL, right click, save JPEG. I get that. That makes sense where NFTs as a mechanism for enforcing value around that medium of art are unencumbered when it comes to copyright law. For music, however, there are legal remedies for the owners of those copyright to effectively sue into oblivion anyone that shares it in the form of damages. So this may be because of like Napster and peer to peer file sharing and an overreactive response to what the internet enables. But again, the music industry has been around as a media industry longer than film. It is arguably the oldest media industry. And therefore, we're entrenched in these old laws and ways of doing things and enforcing copyright. Ironically, copyright is supposed to protect artists. So if you're selling NFTs, making a ton of money, it shouldn't really apply. But the way that copyright law understands interacting with music online, specifically with streaming, whether it be just something playing in the background or something you deliberately search and then play, an interactive stream versus a non-interactive stream, requires that the application or service provider that is enabling that hosting that file or facilitating the playback of that file, that media asset, they need to pay performing rights royalties on that work, and they need to also pay mechanical royalties on that work. So on Catalog, if I go and upload a song right now, and I put it out as an NFT, but I'm also represented by a performing rights organization like ASCAP, or um, I think it's like SOCAN in Canada, there's many others, each within respective countries or territories, they collect performing rights royalties. And then there is also this mechanical royalty side, which in some cases are collected privately, and then in others they're collected, for example, in the U.S. by the Mechanical Licensing Collective. And the way that copyright law reads currently, even if we make the argument that what we're selling is not the copyright, it's not the file, it's not even access to that thing, it's just an autograph, if you will, from the artist pointing to this song as an idea, there are still interactive and non-interactive streams happening that require blanket licenses by these service providers. So their user-generated content platforms, end users upload their work. In some cases, it's them in these beta applications, but in others, let's just take, for example, people uploading work through just a, an application UI. They will click a user agreement that says, like, hey, I own all the rights to this, and that will absolve the service provider, in this case the application, from copyright infringement. But per DMCA, Digital Millennium Copyright Act, they need to be registered copyright agents with a copyright office so that they have a takedown process. So, like, obviously, this, this is more like YouTube, SoundCloud, if, as you can imagine, like, anyone can upload anything to YouTube. YouTube cannot be sued if someone uploads something that is someone else's copyright. But... YouTube is responsible for taking that down if someone reports that it is someone else's copyright. And, then, and you know, that kind of makes sense. I shouldn't be uploading Kanye West and taking in ad revenue, claiming that it's not Kanye West, but it's in fact my work. That's a very web two old way of thinking of things. In this case, let's say it is the artist uploading something. And let's say they don't care about collecting streaming royalties or royalties from the streaming events happening on these songs. It does not matter. Copyright law does not care about that individual person who may solely have created this entire work on the songwriting and recording side by themselves, if they are protected by a performing rights organization, if they do have money being collected via publishing, that still needs to go through those channels. The onus is on the service providers, in this case the applications, to pay those performing rights royalties and those mechanical royalties. And to my knowledge, there are no NFT marketplaces today doing both of those. And it's this like kind of weird example of we're not selling these things, but the way we look at them, just looking at the internet as it is, these are streaming events happening per how we look at copyright law and how we would interpret that. You want to go down the rabbit hole a little bit, it gets interesting when these service providers say they do register with the copyright office, they are protected under DMCA as UGC service providers, they do pay these royalties. What happens even then if they get a takedown notice? of a song that is on our weave or IPFS immutably. Are there going to be legal defenses for, hey, this song came through, say, Catalog's UI. We no longer populate it on our UI because we got a takedown notice, but we can't do anything about it being pinned on IPFS. Are they, there going to be legal ramifications there? I'm really curious to see a case of that emerge. So I love that you said, if you want to go further down the rabbit hole, and I was like, 
Jack, I feel like we're down the rabbit hole already, my friend, because that was a window into a level of thinking that I know most people aren't diving into here as they're exploring Web3 music. And yeah, I think that's that's a fascinating, right? We're going to have this sort of separation between front ends and the databases, essentially. And I think we're seeing that probably be litigated first in the DeFi space, but definitely something to, to keep an eye on. My guess is that there will just be infinite number of front ends and and folks will be responsible for, for those front ends and not for the underlying tech, but curious to see. I guess Zora, maybe it's Zora and Rarible, maybe are the only ones that have actually launched protocols or platforms as they are versus more integrated stacks with like OpenSea and sound, et cetera. Fascinating. Right. So like you upload a song to catalog, let's say they go through all those you know legal remedies to protect themselves and a year from now, someone's like, hey, I co-wrote that song with that artist, take that down. And they do, and they take it down. That stuff could still be served on OpenSea and rendered on OpenSea. And then it's like, what's the remedy for notifying OpenSea? Like, hey, you also have to take this down. So it's a challenge for what we've yet to, we haven't reached a scale where there's enough money being made or there's enough infringement happening, where the bodies within the music industry that typically go after things like this have... Yeah, and I guess that's the thing, right? It's like, like it's a very litigious space generally, or there are litigious uh, organizations in it. Back to your earlier point of there, they're not really being an industry around crypto art or art generally. That sort of have these big bodies that would throw their money around. So, yeah, interesting, interesting to see. All right, I want to pull us up from the rabbit hole a little bit, or maybe take us down a separate rabbit hole because one of the the things that I think I most associate with you is just being very early into leaning into seemingly obscure experiments that turn out to be fairly impactful, specifically thinking about the work that you did in partnership with RAC around tape and around the RAC token. I think right now you're sitting in a position where you are part of an organization that's really trying to rethink how, well, rethink and and sort of, I guess, support artists to come into Web3 in, in these new models. So I'm really curious if you can take us into your world today what are you working on at Hi-Fi Labs? And then are there specific experiments that either you guys are running there or that you would like to see run that we might be looking back on in, in a year or two as in the same vein as we are looking back on the RAC tape drop? Yeah, so I, I can only hope that we get some of the notoriety that the tape drop got as I look down at a box of 70 cassette tapes that still sits on my floor. But at Hi-Fi Labs, it, it's for me, the biggest realization of the past year and maybe even two years, if we were to extend it back, even to my time at Consensus, is that what Web3 really does is make creators their own platforms. When you assume a world where identity, the assets you create, the data around behaviors and actions, such as like a follow event on social media or like a like event, and the rules for interacting with that can all sit in a ownerless network, you all of a sudden have those identities own what belongs to them while no one else does. And the only real area for platforms to exist is like Web3 itself. And the new social media's platforms, because they are, they, they are built on platform tech. But Web3 itself is platform tech. So we'll have applications on top rather than these platforms straddling all sides and connecting the relational information. So look no further than catalog. They're merely just a UI facilitating an onboard into one of ones. Sound, same thing. They're merely just a UI facilitating this experience around these 25 NFTs that belong to the artists that are deployed as an artist contract deployed from their wallet. And the NFTs, the assets themselves belong to the people who buy them. And that ties them to the artist via their identity, via wallet. So at Hi-Fi Labs, I was turned into this idea of, I need to put my money where my mouth is. I, I have this itch to like go out and build product It's where my heart is, but the artists should be building these products. The artists are now, and and they are in a lot of senses. So I'm inspired by seeing this and I want to enable artists to build out the applications they want to see for them. I describe Ethereum and Web3 as this blank open design space where you can program anything with values using any form of logic, formal logic that you want. Like that's it. Forget anything else you know and just take that if nothing else. So what do you want to do? (laughs) And for me, like you look at the legacy music business and it's predominantly go to a label, you sell your copyright, you get cash, or you start touring first, you make a bunch of money from live performances. There's very cookie cutter models and those are all great. And they've worked well for artists. Obviously we recognize that there's a lot of value being extracted from the artist class that should not be. But as we look at Web3, 
what's preventing those same extractions of value from the artist from happening again? And this is the thing that keeps me up at night. It's the thing that's kept me up at night more than anything over the past five years is we have this very hard tech that can certainly liberate these things through what I described. You have identity assets, behaviors, actions, but who's preventing companies from getting into the same value extraction that we've seen historically? And we're seeing it within Web3. Like we're seeing NFT marketplaces do co-promotion and negotiate very, very large double-digit percentage splits with the artists because they stand to help a lot. And it's it's egregious at best. At worst, it's just an emulation of the very things we've been doing. Like I tell people, you're so high on Web 2. Like, get off that. Put it down. Like, we live in this world of collaboration now. And, and obviously, that, that only means something to certain people in certain contexts. But at Hi-Fi Labs, we can work with individual artists, whether they're signed to us or not, and we can explore what their Web3 strategy is. I'll use REC as an example, because what he does as, on his own, as his own platform, is kind of this perfect example of how an artist leverages Web3. As you know, he, as a part of Seed Club, he released a social token in October of 2020. He retroactively distributed it to his audience, fans across multiple applications and platforms, all the way back to 2009. People that bought something on Bandcamp back in 2009 got emails saying, hey, you can come collect some tokens that will get you into Discord, etc. Well, what we were able to do was, in the most boring sense, it's a CRM fabric. In the coolest sense, it's, you know, it's a social token, but it really sits everywhere in between there as well. We're able to create experiences for fans where that audience or the thing that indicates that you're a fan of REC belongs to you and REC only. So now REC can build an application and he can create some mechanism for verifying how many tokens you have and he can release unreleased music just to those people. Great. That's not very crazy. Um, People understand that. What he can also do is say an application or a company approaches him and they want to build something with him, he can say, all right, yeah, just plug into my audience. They're all right there. You can query who holds RAC, and then if you want to create a threshold of how many it is, great. So that's cool. For me, this is like this biggest unlock of migrating new users into Web3 because at Ujo, I was like trying to sell you all a bunch of ideals and walking through complicating UX that you were unfamiliar with. When REC did the retroactive token drop, a bunch of people didn't have MetaMask. They had never interacted with Ethereum in any way whatsoever. They had never interacted with crypto, be an exchange or otherwise. And yet they were so keen on going through the process to get these REC tokens because it was an artist that they had this affinity for offering it to them. And it indicated a permanent link of their relationship. That's pretty cool. So at HiFi Labs, we're exploring the idea of open source products that all artists can use and deploy for their own audience as being their own platform. But then we're really just trying to be the best deal you can get. We don't know if, and we kind of are, we're acting as a technology manager, I think, in in a legacy way of describing what we do. We do sign artists. We're on our way to signing up to 25 artists by the end of Q1 next year. But we also work with artists that, like REC, are, are not signed to us, but want to build some stuff with us. And in that case, we're, we're acting as their technology partner. But traditional companies like management companies, they take a percentage point over a fixed time frame. I don't know if that's right. And this is something that we're exploring right now with a whole group of artists that want to work with us is, hey, 5% for five years for talent development, show development, release schedule development, content strategy, brand and image strategy and development. All those things are something that we can do. And we think that 5% for five years for an emerging artist is a good deal. We don't think it's extracting too much, but we don't know if that applies to Web3. In fact, just symbolically, like I'm going to tell you right now, if I sign an artist to Hi-Fi Labs, I don't want to take 5% of their catalog NFTs. I don't think that's right. I don't know if taking 5% of, say, their collectibles NFTs is right. But if we build a social token, you can imagine where the uncirculating token supply might sit in a multi-sig with us and the artist, and there might be 80% outstanding token supply, and we could be like co-owners of that, and that's not too much because it's more strategic partnership. And so there's really no like cookie-cutter model for musicians in Web3 that have emerged yet, and this is something that I've recognized somebody needs to solve for, so I'm excited to do it through the lens of Hi-Fi Labs 
But then there's also this question of IP and where it exists. If we develop applications and ideas for artists to use, can we make it co-owned by them and not just something that we build and owned, making us look like something like a platform? So it's more in the model, I think, of how a company like a management company can work with an artist that I hope becomes prolific in the future. And if we could do that within a year, that would be incredible. Yeah, I think this idea of co-ownership is essential here. And and I think it, it is really what that sort of token layer, DAO layer, community token, whatever we end up calling it, ultimately brings to the table, where the value that an early manager or fan or whoever is sort of enacting or interacting in that ecosystem can create early on often isn't captured in a specific time window, or, or at least that incentive might lead to short-term thinking compared to what could otherwise be done through broader ownership or partnership. So yeah, excited to see how you guys push that forward. Obviously, we're big believers in that sort of early alignment on the, the DAO level or community token level as being like the right model directionally, at least. I think there's a lot of nuance to it, and especially when you start to jump into NFTs and, and see revenue coming through and also doing with these organizations that still have sort of quasi legal frameworks around them. But interesting to dive into nonetheless. I know that you have a number of ideas in your brain that you are excited about that you want to see in the world, but aren't in the world right now. I'm curious if you can sort of highlight yeah, I mean, if you if you could just have a team go build something tomorrow that would push us forward in a meaningful way as it relates to music and, and Web3, what's missing or, or what would get you really excited? Oh, man. Well, there's so much there, right? I mean, there's consumer fan side things around curation and using token mechanisms for incentivizing curation of new music. The music could be like traditionally licensed through normal channels, but then you have like fan incentives of curation with token design. And I think I, that's something I explored a lot of consensus. And we're not talking about that in this era of NFTs and social tokens and DAOs. And I'm super, super excited to experiment with that when the time is right. For example, like you could do it in Discord with BPM bot, and then you could you could create a chart bot in Discord that leverages BPM bot, which is catalog NFTs. And you could have like a rolling seven day time window that people vote with emojis in Discord to basically say, yes, I like this song. I want to upvote it into the chart. And then at the end of each like seven day rolling time frame, based on who you voted for, you get like a curation score and you're rewarded with ERC20 reputational tokens or even like non-transferable tokens or even like DIDs, which aren't even necessarily on chain. And I don't know what the right technical design is there, but this idea of incentivizing curation and rewarding through reputation to start pronouncing curators is great. And like, that's obviously for a certain set of people. Not everyone wants to go and curate music and like listen to the bottom of the barrel and find the stuff that's good and let it rise to the top. But the result of that are music charts. And everybody loves music charts. If you give me a curated list of music that's already been sorted and favored by a lot of people, like that's easy. I can plug into that. I don't need to like anything or do anything, but like so it's kind of a twofold product there where you've got music curation going on, but then you also have potentially this mass consumer layer of curated music. That's exciting. And we built out some smart contracts for mechanisms around that at Ujo that are probably not the best implementation of how to go about that, but I think are certainly still good learnings. Another idea, and I think the more potent idea that I have right now, and please find me, reach out to me if you want to build this, because I want to put everything I have behind this idea like at this very moment, is just a dashboard for all the things happening within music and Web3. I think we've now reached a critical mass of artists and fans doing things across catalog, across sound. They're in FWB. They're in Seed Club. They're doing things on Song Camp. They're in Water and Music reading there. We have this massive overlapping community within Web3 and music right now where we would benefit from like a central hub. And in the spirit of Web3, let's lean into the information that's available. So what I tell people that have ever used like Zerion or Zapper.fi for like NFTs and DeFi stuff is like, what if you had something like that where you go and you connect your wallet and you could see all the music NFTs you own, or you could see the mere crowd funds that you've supported for musicians. And what if there's been like over 20 different musicians launching crowd funds on Mir, and each of one comes with a token so now we have that context. And then most of those artists do catalog NFTs. And now with sound released last week, those artists are also doing these sound NFTs. And they also hold social tokens that were launched, say, on Coinvise 
from these artists. So who out there is creating the dashboard that allows me to just put on a certain set of goggles that allows me to only see the music related activity happening? And I think it's those core features. It's crowdfunds, it's NFTs, and it's social tokens, but it's just music. So let me go and like see all the crowdfunds happening, link out to them, or be able to support them directly within the UI if their contracts are compatible for doing that. Or let me click on like the crowdfund that I support and then see the other people that supported it, click on one of their wallets, and then go to their profile and see what NFTs they own, or see what maybe in the future what they're listening to on BPM bot, if they can connect their Discord. Where's the social element in one place that doesn't necessarily build any new features, but just brings in all the various features happening across all these applications? That to me shows Web3 in like one file swoop. And it's only a matter of time before someone builds that from music. And I think that once you then have that, like what's stopping you from doing that like curation level thing within that application itself, where then you could have this be an experience for listening to music, curated music, et cetera. And it's a social network almost. So I think that's a very potent thing. That's my idea if anyone wants to go build it. I love that so much. Jack, we're, we're up on the hour here. Fascinating conversation as always. And appreciate you taking us through some of the more nuanced rabbit hole type of discussions that I think should hope to inform more people who are interested in taking action in the space. And I think I'm always try to remember that the more information and context that we can provide to people who are wanting to lean into Web3, you know, it's, it's such a confusing, muddy, foggy world to be in, even if you're in it, but definitely if you're stepping into it. And I think conversations like this just put a lot more data points on the ground for people to, to start to follow. So I appreciate you joining us here today. What is the best place for people to find you on the internet? It's my Twitter, just at Jack Spallone ridiculously underfollowed there, Jack. We've got to get your Twitter game up here a little bit for the cool things that you're working on. <laughs> we'll get some retweets out of there. But I'm in. Well, I appreciate you taking the time. And for those listening, go give Jack a follow. Check out Hi-Fi Labs. There's a lot of interesting things that are going to be dropping there in the new year. And really excited to see the work that you're doing. And very, very, very stoked that you're back in the industry working as hard as you are. So we'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Jack. Jess, thank you so much.